Hello and welcome to Orange Source Wall. My name is Elvis and as always, I am your host. Alright, so this is going to be a short episode because not only do we have very few news tidbits, but also not that much in terms of new releases and of course just the one episode of Stargirl. Alright, so let's get on with some news topics, the biggest one of which is all this controversy surrounding Batwoman and its casting decisions regarding what it's going to do with replacing Ruby Rose as Kate Kane, including speculation that they're going to be killing off Kate Kane rather than keeping the character around to appear in guest spots and cameos. That caused a lot of uproar, not only from actual fans of the show. Like I said, this is something you're going to have to really work hard at transitioning the audience that they do have into accepting the new status quo, the new sort of circumstances the show finds itself in. And killing off the character, killing off the main character, is definitely not the way to do that. Now, there are people on the writing staff that have come forward and said that they're not going to be killing off the character. The character is just going to be disappearing and that's going to be part of the new myth arc, much like Bruce Wayne's disappearance was the myth arc behind the first season or so. And I, to me, that's sounds perfectly fine and natural but this has also led to a lot of disputes and disagreements from fans not only of the show but also the Batwoman character who feel that even replacing Kate Kane as a character with the moniker Batwoman is doing a disservice to the character and to the legacy of that character and that they would be much more comfortable with just the recasting of Ruby Rose rather than ditching Kate Kane entirely which I can sort of see I can I can totally get behind but it's not like Kate Kane was the first Batwoman it does seem kind of like the lesser two evils if they aren't going to be killing up the character if they are just going to be keeping it in part of the mystery so whatever happens i do think that it's probably going to be for the best they don't kill the character because that would be really really lame there are some things that people have brought up where it would be like with regards to the fact that if they did kill the character it would make all the build up and all the mysteries and plot arcs and dynamics from the first season completely pointless so let's just hope they're smart enough to segue away from that and the biggest news in comics sum this week was that dc is finalizing its move away from diamond as a distributor and it's going to be from now on using other distribution services for its floppies and ongoing and using Random House Penguin Publishing to release its collections and omnibuses and trades and all that kind of stuff. Now this was a huge uproar. We have a lot of people, especially CG style YouTube grifters, saying that this is a moral majority move on DC's part, despite the fact that the ire and the aggravation toward diamond distribution has been a constant in the industry for decades now so this isn't like a sort of oh my god people cancel diamond distribution because of the some sort of sjw agenda nonsense which i've seen actual youtube videos being made on which is completely ridiculous and how much the audience actually buys into that and it's a complete mess all around people have made comparisons to when marvel tried to move away from diamond distribution with like heroes world and how that went belly up you know hopefully fingers crossed it goes better for dc this time around anyway that's it for comics news let's move on to what i read this week the first of which is captain ginger season two number three and this was a pretty good issue it's something that like i said i don't think this season of captain ginger is as good as the first season it's something that i felt really did waste a lot of time and the second issue should have been the first issue and this issue works well as the second issue where if the actual second issue was the inciting event this issue is where we start to actually let ourselves get some breathing room some distance from the situation and start to actually sort of set the grounding level for the characters where they are how they're interacting with the new situation with new conflict and with the new dynamics and the bevy of new side characters that are introduced and actually taking brass tacks and really formulating where they stand on a bunch of these things it allows us to actually sort of settle down and realize and just reassess what the series is throwing at us and to really come to terms with it. The first issue I thought was a lot of retreading and this issue it just feels like it actually has more solid footing. It's just a shame that there's only like one or two issues left of this season and it deserves so much more. This constant the second season was that they start encountering a planet of the dogs but it doesn't really seem to be that utilized this far. The best parts of the issue is that we actually start to see the first contact between these two species and it is as cute and adorable and funny and also slightly misgiving and tense as you would expect but that's about it that's what i mean is that three issues in you expect to see a lot more going on you expect to see a lot more of the tensions rising a lot more of the drama being developed but it feels like we're only getting to like the first act of a larger story and that's not really what we're doing here what we're doing here is that we're already like 60 percent through the story and it just feels like we're getting started and that's not a good feeling i don't feel satisfied at all and that is complete 
180 from the first season which felt like it was taking its time but also actually doing great work in developing the characters and developing the world and the environment of the spaceship. This issue just kind of cements how just messy and unfocused it was to even have the characters spread out and disconnected from each other. So disparate and so well detached from each other. There's no real unifying force here so far. You have maybe the tribe of dogs being a great sort of compliment to the characters we've come to know and love but we're not given them much in terms of paid real estate to really understand if that's the case here and captain jr himself has been oddly sidelined even though his character is one of the most developed so far and actually the most interesting so overall this third issue is fine on its own it's funny like i said it's also touching and it's very memorable in its gags i think that's one thing that tom payer is solidly delivering on in his ahoy comics output but other than that, it is less engaging and less interesting than the first season, even though everything about it should be more engaging and more interesting because it is taking itself out of its comfort zone. But maybe it shouldn't have. Maybe it should have waited a little bit longer because right now it feels like we're just barely getting to know these characters and the characters that we did get to know are being stalled in their progression in ways that feel lackluster and anticlimactic. So overall, one thumb middle, one thumb up. And after that, we have the premiere issue of the new sequel to The Boys, The Boys, Dear Becky from Garth Bennis. And I'm going to have to say this right out of the way. It is an issue that is going to make a lot of people I hate really, really happy. And by that, I mean, it seems almost entirely geared for the most part, like 80% of this issue seems to be angled toward like the comic skate, like anti-SJW conspiracy nut crowd so much of the pages especially in the first half of this issue are dedicated to like a rant about ultra left-wing sjw woke rambling like i have no idea why there's so much of that it's it's entirely rhetoric about how the left eats itself how the left controls and overmines and dictates what's going on on social media and it, it just it just goes on and on it's just endless panels of this shit and i have to wonder i was almost like in disarray like why is Ennis really wasting this precious real estate, this precious page space on this bullshit? It's, it's not something that actually means anything. It feels like an old man's rant. Like this isn't like story content. It's not even character content. It's just lecturing mumblings and meanderings of a writer that feels his age at this point. It doesn't have any sort of thematic weight behind it. There's a huge disconnect between like these seven pages of rambling, ranting nonsense and the actual horror of the issue. And it feels like he just needed something to kick the story off with and that he didn't know how to get there so he just wrote stream of consciousness bullshit and he just left it there it feels like such a disappointment after waiting such a long time to read a follow-up to the boys especially one that's going to be delving even more into the relationship between butcher and his wife becky which was the emotional and probably the the strong foundational pillar of the boys throughout its lows and highs and just to be like face of a deluge of bullshit like that you know the kind of stuff that the youtube grifters make their money off of and i was afraid i was afraid like oh my god this is this is such a downgrade like i know people can talk about how much of the boys was fixated on the same kind of cynical ranting commentary about the comics industry and i can't fault for that there's a lot about the boys that is very juvenile that is more missed than hit and that is very this guy is facile and surface level in its critiques there's a lot in the boys that feels just there to make people angry even though there is a lot of stuff i felt was really interesting really impactful and powerful it's also really really dumb and just completely underwhelming at points too and the first couple of pages of dear becky number one are all of those combined in that way it's, it seems perfect built to get people pissed off and to be like ha huh, this is why they're getting pissed off because i gotcha and it's a shame like it seems purpose built to be like ha huh, see garf Ennis, he's got my back on these sjw freaks that's not something that we should really be feeding it really isn't they have this persecution complex that even the most minute critique of them they take as evidence that they're fighting the resistance and the rebellion against some sort of evil conspiracy some really pathetic and asinine stuff like that and you know, that's not really what I want to read the boys for. I want to read the boys because of how just completely powerful and, and impactful it can get. And there are some pages that are like that in this, like a couple of pages. And that's what's going to keep me reading. Because if it weren't for those, I would completely believe that Ennis has lost his touch. It feels so detached, dissonant, and just completely amateurish. It really does. It feels like 
the kind of thing you would read on a 12 year old's blog after he's gone down some sort of YouTube rabbit hole and you should expect more from the writer of Hitman or the writer of War Stories. But even though it is kind of stupid and silly that one of the big set pieces of this issue is that they cut off Billy Batson's tongue so he can't say Shazam at them, that at least felt like a really standard NS boys gag and I could totally live with that. It'll get people pissed off because you know NS's humor is so stupid like that sometimes but at the very least I understand that's actually a genuine joke he's trying to like make rather than my god the left cannibalize themselves for like two pages because that doesn't feel genuine that feels pandering. So yeah overall one thumb down one thumb middle. I'm hoping that the rest of the series for however long it lasts, I don't think they've said how long it's going to last, does more, is more, and actually is up to snuff for a writer of Ennis's caliber. Anyway, let's head on to what I watched this week. We have one episode this week of Stargirl episode 4, Wildcat. And this is the first of two episodes that's going to be written by James Robinson, who is one of the most notable JSA writers of the modern age. So, you know what? It was really nice to see him actually tackle an episode of the show and you can definitely feel his influence on it because this episode felt a lot heftier a lot more serious it actually handles and tackles a really weighty topical issue and it does it in a way that feels grounded and realistic rather than just kind of forced and lazy and exaggerated it's a topic that i think deserves an even balanced strong hand to actually write about and to have actors depict and have a plot center around and it actually hits hard i think the actors especially the actors playing wildcat do a great job handling the idea of cyberbullying especially when you had distribution of sex and lewd photos throughout like a school setting which is a really really important issue that has happened a lot i've seen it happen firsthand when i was in high school and it's something that is devastating and emotionally racked and a completely unknowable amount of trauma and this episode doesn't really shy away from it for a show like this which is very fluffy very candy corn bubblegum poppy at times it does take itself seriously and it doesn't take itself seriously in a way that feels like oh look how serious we're being no it just completely grounds it plays it straight and doesn't leave anything up to interpretation about what it's trying to say and about what the characters are feeling about it like the most amazing part of this episode is that Yolanda Montez Wildcat is dealing with these issues on her own even her family is completely emotionless and cold and distant because of the cyberbullying that she went through and when she finally starts to deal with that on her own when she starts to actually get some sort of self and and some sort of esteem back and she confronts her family with it trying to say that hey we need to deal with this in the family and need you to actually start you know protecting me and to standing up for me and to supporting me her family which also is like completely straight laced hispanic family and that's something that i've grown up and that's something that i've dealt with my entire life they are just having none of it they're saying that it was her responsibility it was her fault and that it was something that she should have been more careful of and it shows that she's not responsible that she's not mature and that that she should bear responsibility for because it's it's something that reflects on them as well and as harsh as that might be and as horrible as that might sound coming from her mother and father it's something that's so true life and it's something that i've seen it's something that i've experienced when some things have just kind of crumbled down around my family because you have to understand like the cultural strictness it is really sobering it's a sobering episode there's a lot of things i didn't like about it for one the idea that ted grant had some sort of wannabe black panther power armor suit that augmented his abilities and made him super strong and agile and flexible which i think completely undermines the idea and the and the unique quality of ted grant that he was just a boxer who could go one-to-one -one with like the jsa and superheroes and supervillains but overall i think that's probably my only real complaint on a superficial level on a character level on a world building level my other complaint is that this episode does a lot to humanize and to create sympathy for brainwave jr where we get a look into how he's dealing with things how he dealt with his relationship with yolanda and how he's dealing with the pain he's feeling both from that i guess and also his father's critical injuries and my only complaint with that is that the first episode sets him up so much as like this really detestable, unlikable, gropey, rapey sex creep that it doesn't really ring true that they're trying to make him a likable, very sympathetic, really emphatic character right now. Because if that was the plan, if the plan was to make him an emphatic character for us to really understand him more, then maybe tone that down 
Like maybe maybe don't go as far as they did in the first episode. It makes it hard for the viewer to make the jump. It's something that could have been handled a lot better. Overall though, it's a great episode. It's one that I felt really stood apart from the other episodes in the series. It stands apart from CW as a whole. And it handled a tricky topic. Maybe not the best, but probably the best I've seen the CW handle any kind of topic like this. Overall, two thumbs up. We even get a little wry reference to the shade there because of course you have Robinson writing but so he's definitely going to put his main man fan favorite character the shade in there but yeah really engaging really enthralling episode and it's good to know that we're at least moving forward with the emotional parameters of this series trying new things so you know what I'm happy about that anyway that's it for this week as always I want to say thank you to everyone for listening and if anyone has own question comments or topics you always find me on twitter at the underscore s-n-i-c-k-m-a-n I'm always humbled by them and they just mean so much to me it, it really do and I just want to give a shout out to the cover for this show at d-o-t-e-m-c-e-e please check them out they're amazing give them all the support you can and well again thank you for listening it means the world to me have a great weekend and see you again next time